Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, you guys doing good? You guys excited to be here with us? Congratulations, newly married couple. You guys ready to worship Jesus with us this morning? Come on. Let's give him all the praise this morning, church. Amen. Father, we give you praise this morning, Jesus. God, all the glory to you, Lord. These songs are for you, Lord. This worship is for you. We give you all the praise, Father.
so faithful, Father. Rejoice this morning, church. Father, you are so good to us, Lord Jesus. So good to us, Lord. We give you praise this morning, Father. Sky. 
you high, Father. God, so will I. Father, in this moment right now, God, I choose to lift up your name, Lord. God, give you all the praise you're worthy of, Father. Because, God, you are so worthy, so worthy, God.
Come on, from your heart, church, you sing it to him. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sun of all our praise is still for shine, then we'll sing. failure and pride Come on, on a hill on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die lift it up and as you speak a hundred billion faith Disappear. You lost your life so I could find it. Yeah. If you left the grave behind you, so so thankful this morning, God, for who you are. The song speaks so well of your greatness, God. God, we can't do much, Lord, in return. We really can't. But Father, we offer our worship to you this morning. God, we offer our song, Lord, our hearts to you, Father. And I know sometimes it's not easy for us to come in and worship. Sometimes you know, life gets tough, things get hard. We doubt sometimes. We have questions. But man, he's given us life, amen? He is a good father. So God, this morning we give you everything we have. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise pour out our praise into your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only into your breath come on in our lungs so we pour You give life, you give life, you 
Let's sing this morning. Into your prayer. Scare the enemy this morning, sure. Sing it out. Come on, that's it. You go ahead.
Father. Come on, give him praise, church. How many people are ready for God's Word now? Come on, you ready for God's Word? You ready, ready, ready for God's Word? I want to give a shout out, welcome to our online church, people in our city, people in our province, our nation, and around the world. I have people from all around the world that email and say, I watched, I was part of your service on Sunday in Africa, in India, in Europe, and people across our city. We welcome you today as you are a part of this service. Last Sunday, we began our fall sermon series. It's called I Pray. Have you ever wondered, how should I pray? What do I pray? Does God hear my prayers? Do my prayers make a difference? I think we're blessed that the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. And then Jesus gave what we now call the Lord's Prayer. It's a pattern. It's a model. And I had you say it last week, and I caught on that many people don't know the Lord's Prayer. And I, I reminded myself, if you're my young age, back in the days when I was born, Abraham, Isaac, Moses, people like that, not really. Uh, back in the late 60s, yes, I started school in the late 60s, hard to believe, in the 70s. Do you remember the days in the public schools, every day you'd sing the national anthem and then recite the Lord's Prayer? Anybody of that generation? How would people love to see those days come back in Jesus' name? And uh, so come on, come on, everybody. Yeah, I know you've been up and down, but get on your feet one more time. We got we to do this right. It's not even on the screen. I want, you to, I want you to get it in your hearts. You ready? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Oh, man. Come on, you can do all oh, man better than that. Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, take a seat. There are eight prayers, eight phrases that we're exploring in this eight-part sermon series. Last Sunday, we... We just camped on the prayer of connection, our, our Father in heaven. Jesus knew that the word Father was, was a new word because it's only mentioned seven times in the Old Testament. And he just broke out the myths, and he shattered the myths, and he, he said, Our Father. And the Greek word is pater. The Aramaic word is, is Abba. And it's an intimate word. It's a close word. It's a connective word. He said, Our Father in heaven. And last Sunday, we began to unpack that many of us struggle in, in, in connecting with a Father in Heaven because we, we know our earthly Father and we, we transpose our negative image of earthly Father to our Heavenly Father. Some of you, probably many of you, many of you emailed me this week or called me or pulled me aside. So that message last Sunday hit home because my dad was absent or my dad was angry or my dad was abusive or my dad was unconcerned or, or unconnected. And so we, we took all of those misconceptions and we lined them up last Sunday under the truths of who our God is. And we looked at four truths, and, and some of those truths were he's, he's a close God, he's a caring God, he's, 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 he's a competent God, he, he's a God like no other God, he's our God. And, and we, we begin to explore that he wants to affirm us and he wants to approve us. And so your prayer life goes to a new level when you begin to connect with him as your Abba Daddy, your Papa, your Father, and we love him so much. Now today, everybody say today, today, we're going to explore the second phrase, the second prayer that is in the Lord's Prayer. And the second prayer is, hallowed be your name. And if you were raised in the King James Version days, it's hallowed be your name. And so I want to talk to you today about three things as we unpack this prayer of recognition. Three things. Number one, what does the word hallow mean? Now, now your sinner go, hallow? I, I honestly don't know. Ha Halloween, Mark? No, it's not Halloween. Um, I kind of remember watching something on TV where they talked about the, the hallowed halls of justice. We're no further ahead, are we? I remember in history, my history teacher, grade 10, talked about the, the hallowed grounds of the battlefields. And I loved history. I remember that line. I'm still no further ahead ahead. What does, what does hallow mean? Two things. Write this in your notes. Number one. Number one. To hallow God's name, this, this is what it really means, to honor God's name. When you hallow the name of God, you're giving him the honor that is due to his name. How many people know our God is worthy of all honor? 
Come on, how many people know our God is worthy of all honor? How many people know He's worthy of all honor and worthy of all praise? And when you, when you hallow His name, you're giving Him the honor that is due to Him. Number two, it's when you begin to see His name for its true importance and its true value. You begin to see it for how important His name is, how valuable His name is. And when you begin to see His name for how valuable and how important, you begin to honor it. You begin to hallow His name. So now we've explored the word hallow. Let's go to number two. What's so important about God's name? I mean, why should we hallow His name? So I want to give you three quick things before we come to the heart of the message. Number one, you might know this, but names years ago, years ago, used to be used to indicate who a person was. And so if you were the baker in the city, you're a baker, your last name is Baker. If you were the carpenter, you were the carpenter. If you're a cook, you were the cook. If your dad's name was John, your last name was Johnson. And I want to talk to you about my name, Scar. I mean, you probably never met somebody with that name before. There's not many of us in Canada. Now, just for the record, the origin of my name does not come from Lion King. Just saying. I mean, that was 1994. I mean, the Scar name goes away. Not Lion King. Sorry, sorry. And so I studied it, and Scar is an abbreviation of, of Huskard. It's, uh, what does Huskard, Huskard, house care? And it started to mean a house care person or a butler. And so years ago, somewhere in Europe, somebody was a butler, and they called him Scar. And so names, names, when you study names, they, they, they used to be used to indicate who a person was. Carpenter, cook, baker, scar. Now, number two, each of God's names. Now, by the way, there's hundreds of names of God in the Bible. And I thought, just for fun, we'd look at all hundreds of those names this morning. Relax, I'm only kidding you. We're going to look at some of those names of God this morning. But there's literally hundreds of names of God in the Bible. And each of God's names in the Bible reveal something about his character. It reveals something about who he is. I mean, there's not hundreds of names in the Bible just for fun. God's got all these different names. No, every name reveals something of his character. Every one of those names reveals something about who he is. Now, number three, write this in your notes. When you honor or hallow God's name, when you view it for its importance and its value, you are recognizing and you're valuing God for who he is. You're beginning to see him for who he actually is. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm in my 50s. I've been saved since a young boy, but I'm, I'm still growing in my prayer life. And lately, I've been overwhelmed with who my God is. And I'm beginning to discover that he's a lot more than I thought he was. And the more I begin to understand more about who he is, it's changed radically my prayer life. And I want to talk to you about that today. So I'll take you to the heart of the message. Number three, number three, what happens? What happens when we pray this prayer of, of recognition? What happens when we move from our Father in heaven to halloweth be or hallow be your name? We honor, we honor, we honor your name. And there's three things that I want to leave you with this morning. And the first one it's when we begin to pray this amazing prayer of recognition, you begin to recognize very clearly that God is more than able. God is able to meet your deepest needs. And I felt the Lord say to me, there's going to be hundreds of people, hundreds. There's, there's probably between our two morning service, probably creeping into 2,000 people in, in, our, in our two morning services. But there's going to be, I felt the Lord saying, there's going to be hundreds of people this morning that, that they're going to be sitting here thinking, can God really meet my need. And I want to say it loud. I want to say it clear that when you begin to recognize God for who he truly is, you begin to realize that he can meet your deepest needs. And I want you to look at the screen. There's a scripture there from Philippians 4, 19. My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. How many people believe that God, how many people believe God can meet your deepest needs? How many people believe that God can meet your deepest needs? Come on, I don't think you're convinced this morning. How many people this morning really believe God can meet your deepest needs? He can. I want you to write this in your notes. When you recognize, when you begin to really truly recognize God, for who he really is, you're positioning yourself to receive 
what he can really do in your life. And that statement has radically changed me. And I, I wrote that down on my notes this week. And I felt the Lord saying to me, Mark, Mark, if you begin to grow in your spiritual journey, you see, whether you've been saved for one day, three weeks, or 80 years, you keep on growing in your faith. And the more you get to know God, the more you understand Him for who He really is, the more you are positioning yourself to receive what He can really do in your life. And so I want to very quickly this morning give you just nine, just, just nine of the ancient Hebrew names of God in the Bible. And, and, and I just want you to listen to them quickly. Number one, Jehovah Jireh. You probably heard that name. Jehovah Jireh means the Lord will provide. How many people believe God can provide? Do you believe it? How many people believe the Lord will provide? And there's some of you sitting here today, you're like, Mark, I'm, I'm in transition. My job has come to closure. I'm nervous about the bills, but, but you need to hear me. Where, where, whether you have a job today or you don't have a job today, God is your provider. Your boss might write your check, but God is the provider. Don't put your trust in man. Put your trust in God. Some of you are sitting here today, Mark, the mortgage is there. The bills are there. I'm sweating. God is your provider. The Lord not just can provide, the Lord will provide. When you shift gears from he can, oh, I know he can, he will provide. When you begin to get it in your spirit, the God who is able to meet your needs according to his riches and glory loves you so much, he not just can provide, he will provide. He will provide. There's an ancient scripture in Genesis, Abraham, Isaac. I mean, he takes Isaac to the mountain, Mount Moriah, sacrifice and Isaac says, Dad, you got the wood, but where's the sacrifice? The Lord will provide. He gets him on the altar. He's ready to, ready to take the life of his boy, and God stops him. And then there's a ram in the thicket. And then Abraham pens these words in Genesis 2.14. He called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, on that mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Church, he provided for you before. He'll provide for you today. He, he is your provider. Don't focus on the provision. Focus on the provider. Are you getting this this morning? If when you focus on the provision, you're seeking the hand of God. But when you focus on the provider, you're focusing on who our God is. Don't focus on what he can do for you. Focus on who he can be to you. Come on, put your hands together and give a clap offering of praise to the Lord. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Number two, Jehovah Rapha. The Lord, the Lord who heals. I want to ask a question that you're sitting here today and God's healed you in mind or in body. He's done a miracle. He's healed you. I want you to stand to your feet right now. You've received a healing from the Lord. Come on, stand to your feet right now. Stand to your feet. You've heard Jesus. Is, it's been Jesus. It's, come on, look at the people standing to their feet this morning. It's been Jesus who healed you. Come on, give a loud clap offering of praise to our healer. He's our healer. He's our healer. Now take a seat. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God, do what is right in his eyes, you pay attention to his command, keep all his decrees, I'll not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I'm the Lord who heals you. Just like you don't seek the provision, you seek the provider. Don't look to the healing, look to the healer. When you are focusing on the healing, you're missing it. Focus on the healer. Don't focus on the hand of God, focus on the face of God. Don't focus on what he can do, focus on who he is. And too many Christians, their, 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 their prayer life is so shallow because it's all about what he can do for you. Church, shift to who he is. He's not just your provider, he is your healer. Ha, let me take you to number three. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, the Lord is our banner. The Lord is our banner. I'm told that the Amalekites had a banner. The Philistines had a banner. The Midianites had a banner. All the enemies of the Israelites held up a banner. And they held up a, like a flag. It was the war banner, the Amalekite banner. And the, and the enemies of the Amalekites would have their banner, and they'd go against Israel. And, and, and the Philistines had their banner, the Philistine banner. And, and, and the Midianites had their banner. All the enemies of God's people had their banner. But God's people said, we don't have a flag that we wave because the Lord, the Lord, oh, man, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is our banner. And in Exodus chapter 15, the Amalekites are coming against the Israelites. And Moses said to Joshua, get some people. We're going to go up against the Amalekites, but I'm going on the mountain. And Moses went on the mountain. You know the story. When his hands were up, they were winning. When his hands were down, they were losing. 
They're winning when their hands are up and he's praying and interceding. His hands are down and he's tired. His, they were being defeated. And so Aaron and Ur started to hold his arms and he sat on a rock. And God brought, brought great victory because Moses was interceding. Because Moses knew it wasn't a javelin, it wasn't a sword, it wasn't a spear, it wasn't the earthly weapons that bring the victory. The Lord is our banner. He will fight your battles for you. Somebody, 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 somebody risk a little amen. Praise the Lord. A hallelujah in the house this morning. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is your banner. The Lord is your banner. And then there's an amazing scripture here. Look at the screen. Exodus 17, 15. Moses built an altar and called it the Lord. The Lord is my banner. Then there's number four. Jehovah Mekhodeshkim. I probably didn't pronounce it right. But it's an ancient Hebrew name for God that means the Lord, the Lord who sanctifies. And in Exodus 31, the name is used. God says to Moses, say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. This will be a sign between me and you for the generations to come so you may know that I'm the Lord who makes you holy. I'm the Lord who sanctifies you. Now, there's three levels of sanctification. Number one, when you come to Christ, you are positionally sanctified and you are placed as a child of God, he becomes your righteousness. He forgives you of your sins and you are positionally placed as a child of God and the penalty of sin is taken away because Jesus took it to the cross. Oh, I don't know how you can be quiet right now. Jesus went to a cross and he took your penalty of your sin and when you come to Christ, you are positionally sanctified and you are positionally placed as a child of God. Someday, you're going to get to heaven when you're a follower of Christ. And, and at the cross, the, your position they place, the penalty of sin is taken, taken care of. Someday you're going to get to heaven, and the presence of sin is going to be gone. There's going to be no sinning in heaven, and we're going to be ultimately sanctified. We're going to be there. We are going to be like, I don't know about you, but I can't wait to see my Jesus face to face. I can't wait to see my Jesus. I can't wait to be face to face with my Lord. I know when I got saved as a young boy, positionally placed as a child of God, the penalty of sin is taken care of. And someday when I get to heaven, the presence of sin is going to be gone, and I'm going to be face to face with my Jesus walking the streets of gold. If you wonder where I am in heaven, I'm going to push my way to the front row just to be right at the feet of my Jesus. I'm going to be hanging out with my dad, my mom, my relatives. I can't wait to see Moses and Abraham. I can't wait to spend all of eternity. Anybody excited this morning about heaven? Am I the only one? Am I, am I the only one? So young Mark got saved someday heaven, positionally sanctified, penalty taken care of, someday ultimately sanctified. I'm going to be in the presence of God, presence of sin God, but while I'm here in between, the power of sin is still working on my life. The devil tempts me and tempts you, and he is progressively working on me and working on you, but how many people know I can't wait to say this. Jesus still can set people free from every bondage, every hang-up, every habit, because he's the God who sanctifies and makes us whole. How many people know he can take someone bound by alcohol and set them free? How many people know he can take someone messed up in drugs and set them free in the name of Jesus Christ? How many people know one encounter with Jesus can change your life? How many people know he, he is not just the one who sanctifies, he is the sanctifier. I'm not focusing on the sanctifying, I'm focusing on the sanctifier. Somebody give a little clap off and a praise to the Lord. Wow. Number five, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. Gideon, the Midianites are attacking and he's freaking out. He gets underground in the wine press, threshing the wheat. Angel Lord shows up and says, Mighty warrior! Here's my translation. Gideon goes, Me? Mighty warrior? Me? Yeah, you. And God used Gideon greatly. And so in the midst of war going on around, he, he pens these words, Judges 6.24. So God built an altar to the Lord there and called it the Lord is peace. He's my, he's my Jehovah Shalom. I'm praying for peace on your mind, peace on your heart, and shalom in your home. Man, I've shared it before, and I'm not going to camp on the story, but I, I just got to share another nugget of the story. You heard the story where cube van pulls in front of my house, and it's a mock abduction they throw someone in the back of the cube van. I thought someone was being mugged, and I'm freaking out. You remember the story. I called the police. Police put them down at gunpoint, and I mean, it's just a mess. It's a wreck. I'm bound by fear. And I shared that story several months ago. In fact, I think I shared it a few years ago, but there's, I won't point them out, but there's a family in our church. She came to me, 
and said, one of those guys who did that at your house is my cousin. Come on, isn't that cool? I want to meet him. <laughs> Anybody ever walk through fear? My mom was 36 years old when her mom died. My mom was so fearful of cancer, she literally looked in the mirror and see growths all over her face. I was raised in a home where fear was prominent and prevalent, and she'd get in the car and she'd cry. I could tell you story after story, but I'll never forget the day. It's in the early 1970s where Jehovah Shalom showed up. And she was prayed for, and she was instantly set free from fear. I'll tell you, church, he is Jehovah Shalom. He doesn't just give peace. He is peace. I said he doesn't just give peace. He is shalom. He's not just the shalom giver. He is shalom. Number six, Jehovah Sabaoth. It means the Lord of hosts. Jehovah Sabaoth means the Lord of hosts. It means the Lord, let me give you a better translation, the Lord of the armies. Not just the Lord of the hosts, the Lord of the armies. And there's young David. You know the story. David's up against Goliath, and Goliath is a big boy. He's, he's huge. He's, he's like over seven feet tall. He's a big, tall guy, and he's way up there. And there's Goliath, and there's little Davy. And Saul wants to put Davy in the armor, and David says, I don't want to wear that. I, 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 don't, I don't come against him with that. Now look at the scripture, 1 Samuel 17, 45. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. I come against you in the name of of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies, the Lord of the host, Jehovah Sebaoth of Israel, whom you have defied. Your most powerful weapon, your most powerful weapon is the name of the Lord Jesus. When you say the name Jesus, power is released. Jesus can set the captive free. Jesus can heal the sick body. Jesus can set, Jesus can do that. There's power in the name of Jesus. He's the Lord of hosts. Come on, give a clap offering of praise to our Lord God. Number seven, Jehovah Reah, the Lord our shepherd. He's our shepherd. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I'll act nothing. I have, there's nothing, he's my shepherd. Some of you today, you're, 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 you're trying to feel emptiness. You think you have to have more, you have to drive the, the nicest car, have the best phone, and you're just driven, 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 driven. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. When you got Jesus, you got everything. Come on, did you hear me today? When you got Jesus, you got everything. Come on, come on, are you with me today? When you got Jesus, when you got him, he's more than enough. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Number eight, Jehovah Shema. The Lord is there. And Ezekiel gives a prophetic vision about what the kingdom of being coming here on earth the millennial age. And then he talks in Ezekiel 40, 35, the distance all around will be 18,000 cubits. And the name of the city from that time on will be the Lord. The Lord, the Lord's there. The Lord's in that city. And I just want to give you a word today. Just like the Lord will be in that new Jerusalem, the Lord is in the house this morning by the power of his Holy Spirit. Jesus, where two or three gathered, he's in our midst. How many of you believe Jesus showed up to church today? Come on, he's in our, he's in our midst today. The Lord, the Lord is here. The Lord is here. Number nine, Jehovah Sidkena. The Lord, our righteousness. The Lord, our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 6. In his days, Judah will be saved. Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord, our righteous Savior. If you want a great homework assignment, explore the hundreds of names of God. Get to know who He is. Don't seek what He can do. Your prayer life will go to a new level when you seek His face and not His hand. And you get to know Him more for who He is. And that will position you greater to receive what He can do. Are you hearing me this morning, church? Seek Him for who He is. Don't seek the provision, seek the provider. Don't seek the healing, seek the healer. Don't seek the action, seek the now. Seek him for who he is. And I tell you, he's a lot more than you could ever imagine. He's my God. He's my Savior. 
I want to take you to the last two points very quickly in our final moments. I just want to share with you, number two, when you pray the prayer of recognition, you begin to recognize that God is greater than our biggest problems. I want to tell you where I'm at, my prayer walk and in my prayer life, and I've done this, I, honestly, I've done it. I've spent years bringing my big problems to God. And I've spent great amounts of my prayer life telling God all my problems. Lord Jesus, I need you to do this. God, if you don't do that, God, my big problem. And now the Lord's been shifting me that I'm not spending as much time telling God how big my problems are. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? I'm now speaking over my problem and telling my problem how big my God is. You can focus on the depths of your problem or you can focus on the height of your God. You can camp on the difficulty of your dilemma or you can zero in on a God who is greater and mightier and bigger. He's bigger. And so I believe, number two, when you pray, how be your name, you're recognizing that God is greater than your biggest problems. Write this in your notes. Here's where I'm at. God, I want your name. I want your name. I want your name, Lord. I want, that's what I pray. I want your name, Lord. I want you. I want your name. Let me give you some scriptures quickly. 1 John 4, 4, you do children are from God. You've overcome them because the one, I love this, who's in you is greater than the one who's in the world. Can I just have a little pause moment? Yes! Yeah! Come on, how many people are glad that the God who's in you is greater than the devil who is roaming the world? Come on! Oh... Psalm 148, 13, let them praise the name, the name of the Lord. Let them exalt, let them praise the name of the Lord. His name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heaven. David said this because David was moving from seeking what God can do to who God is. David was transitioning in his worship and his prayer, focusing more on the healer than the healing, the provider than the provision. So the, the psalmist let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. Look at Psalm 1831. For who is God besides the Lord? Who is the rock except our God? Study the word rock in the book of Psalms. It's all over Psalms because David picks up the analogy that God is our rock. He is our security. He is our firm foundation. He said in Psalm 31, 3, since you're my rock, my fortress, for the sake of your name, I like that, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. But notice this, he focused on who God is. You're my rock, and now because of that, for the sake of your name, would you do something and lead me and guide me? Are you getting it? He focused on the what not the what he can do, but who he is. You're my rock. Psalm 33, 21, in him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Psalm 61, 1 and 2, hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth, I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Before I close with point number three, Job. Remember Job, one day lost everything, family, possessions, boils all over his body. And, and, and these comforters come around him and try to comfort him. And some of the advice he got was horrible advice. Some was good. But the time you get to the end of the book, Job transitions because he gets a revelation of who God is. And I want to read to you Job 42, chapter 42, 1 to 6. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. I mean, he, he had a revelation of who God is. And once he focused on who he is, he said, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Look at verse 3. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. I mean, Job's like, I thought I had you figured out, but man, I don't really know you. I'm just overwhelmed now with who you are. Things too wonderful for me to know. Verse 4. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you. Now, that's radical. Because Job was spending his prayer walk saying, God, you listen, I'm going to speak. And God says, no, you be quiet, I'm going to speak. 
And so in my prayer life, I'm doing a lot less talking and a lot more listening. I'm closing my mouth and I'm meditating on who he is and I'm discovering the more I meditate on who he is, the more he speaks into my spirit. Job said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to clamp that mouth shut, and I'm going to open my ears, and I'm going to open my heart. I've been talking about things I have no clue that I should be talking about. And God says, you be quiet. I'm going to speak. Job says, you be quiet, God. I'm going to speak. And God says, no, no, no. You, you, just, you just tone it down here. I've got something I want to say to you. Look at verse 5. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself. And I repent in dust and ashes. Some of us this morning need to repent of talking too much in our prayer life and not listening enough. Close the mouth and let the heart be open. Focus not on the healing, but on the healer. And when you get to know more who he is, you are positioning yourself to receive more what he can do. Is there a witness in the house this morning? Come on, give a clap offering of praise to the Lord God. The last thing, very quickly, I just want to unpack in our final minutes. When you pray this prayer of of recognizing who he is, you begin to realize that God calls us to be part of his family, his family. I got twin sisters. They're adopted, and I only say that because we're really close in age. My parents didn't think they could have kids, adopted girls. A few months later, she's pregnant. Here I am, surprise, it's me. And they're just a year and a bit older than me. And my whole life, people would say to me, oh, you're Wendy and Wanda's brother. And I'd say, no, 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 I'm not. And they'd say, what? I'd say, no, no, Wanda and Wendy are my sister. And they're just kind of messing with their mind. And I'd have people all the time, are you, are you more scars, son? Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they confuse me with my uncle who pastored. Are you John's boy? No, that's my uncle and, you know, all that. But, but you all know you all know that you are representing your family name. And when God puts you in his family, his reputation is on the line. And he's giving you his reputation. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures, and I'm going to give a few pointers, and then we're going to close. But in Ephesians 2.19, consequently, Paul said, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. A better translation, members of his family. Sir, you're my brother. Ma'am, you're my sister. We are family. You're stuck with me, and I'm stuck with you. But we got the same Heavenly Father. Somebody say amen to that. Isn't it great to be part of a family? And God puts his reputation on us. Now, when you come under our Father in heaven, that's where we started, you got to realize how much he loves you. And I don't think I fully understand how much God loves me. So here's a verse, Ephesians 2, 19. Ephesians 2, I'm sorry, Ephesians 3.18. My apologies. Ephesians 3.18. We may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, long, high, deep is the love of Christ. Because you're in the family and his reputation is at stake, you've got to start by realizing he loves you more than you could ever imagine. And because he loves you, he's not against you, he's for you. And some of what you're walking through doesn't seem fair. Life's not fair, but God is fair. Life may not make sense, but God is still on the throne. He loves you. He's not here to harm you. He's, when he takes stuff from you, sometimes it's to protect you. When he gives you something, it's to bless you. But he's in the driver's seat of your life. He's the CEO. He's our everything. But church, hear it. He loves you so much. But now you have to shift from the God who loves you, living out that love in your life. I was reading this week about Gandhi. Remember Gandhi? He said, I, I might have become a Christian if it wasn't for the Christians I met. Turn to your neighbor and say, ouch. That's a t- I, might have, I might have become a Christian except for the Christians I met. What kind of representation of Jesus are we making? Now, some people, they're, they're going to walk out of the doors and they're going to go back to their schools, to their communities, to their work, and there'll be absolutely no difference between them and everybody else, and no one would even know that you're a child of God because there's no peculiarity, there's no distinguishment, there's no love of God shining through, and no one would even know. You're, do, do your neighbors know that you're a believer in Jesus Christ? Just asking. Do your classmates know? Do your 
do people know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? No, some people, you're just going to leave here and you're just going to blend in. And there's, there's other people, they don't blend in. They just, they just clamp up. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't even know their neighbors. Do you know your neighbors? They're not your enemy. Have you just closed your doors? Oh, I don't want to get too close to them. You know, you know what many people think churches are like? We're a closed door, and this is a private club, and no one's allowed to come in. I got a word for you today. This is just a building. This building is not the church. You are the church, and God wants us to share his love in this community. Your pastoral team are meeting with our ward counselor this Tuesday. We want to ask him, what can we do? to greater help our community. I can't share names, but we live on a street where we've gotten to know our neighbors and we're part of their lives, but there's one neighbor, I can't even give their name, but just, just log this in your head. Would you pray for this neighbor? Because this neighbor has been diagnosed with cancer. They're our age. And she's now in a hospice. The truth be told, with a miracle of God, she's going to die. And just last week, Evelyn's just making some chicken wings and rice, and we're bringing them to our neighbors and feed this guy and his boys. And we're going to the hospice to visit her, and we care, and we just want to practically be there, but we want to also share with them the love of Jesus. Please hear me. God didn't put you on your street by accident. He has strategically placed you where he wants you to be his love in your community. Is this hitting home today? So the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, says some amazing words. And it says it very clearly as in, in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, and I'm almost done. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, follow God's example. Therefore, as dearly loved children, I mean, you're God's children, follow His example. So verse 2, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. The more you understand how much God loves you, the more you will want to share that love with those around you. I don't want us to blend in. I don't want us to be like a monk and isolate ourselves. I want us to get out in the community and incarnate with the love of Jesus Christ. We've got the hope. We've got the answer. Canada, for Ottawa, for the world. And his name is Jesus. And I'm telling you, I'm going on the record. I can't stop. I am not going to give up. I'm in this with the pastors and this. The, I'm here and I'm believing that we're, I'm, I want to see everybody in the greater Ottawa as a follower of Jesus Christ. This building cannot contain what God Almighty wants to do. And God wants to release an anointing of Him on your life. And when you hallow His name and you're overwhelmed with His love, His reputation is online. I pray that we would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power to change lives. Come on, give a clap offering of praise to the Lord God. I want to end this message with three scriptures. These are the three scriptures where the word Christian is mentioned. You know what Christian means? It means of the party of Christ. Christian, Christian. And so in Acts eleven twenty six, Paul gets Barnabas and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, met with the church, taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were first called Christians, first at Antioch. Here's what was going on in Antioch. God was saving people and redeeming them that they were so much like Christ, they were called Christians. Because they were living a life that was so much like Jesus. I'll tell you, church, the Jesus that's in you wants to get out of you. The Jesus that's in you wants to ooze from your pores. That you, you are the living word of God. That when people see you, they would know that there's a difference about you. I pray that out of within us would flow the love of the living God. The second time Christian is used is Acts 26, 28. This is a sermon itself, but here it is. Agrippa, one of the leaders of the day, said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? I'll tell you, I got a whole message on this because we want people, the first time we meet them, to get saved. And we forget, 
we forget that we got to build a relationship and a connection. Most people don't come to Christ until they've heard the gospel a number of times. Some plant, others water. God gives the increase. That's a powerful verse. Let that verse soak in. The final verse, and this one grips me the most. This is the last time the word Christian is used. It's 1 Peter 4, 16. And Peter's writing to the believers who were under great persecution by the Romans, by Nero, and it's, it's bad. I mean, we think we're persecuted when people call us a Jesus freak. Get over it in Jesus' name. There are straws in the lobby. You can pick it up on the way out. Suck it up. I got persecuted. They called me a Jesus freak. Whatever. I'm being serious. Whatever. The believers were being so persecuted. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter said, however, look at the screen, verse 16. If you suffer as a Christian, some of them were martyred for their faith. Don't be ashamed. But praise God that you bear His name. I want you to get on your feet this morning with me, please. And I want you to put your hands together and give a loud clap offering of praise to the Lord God Almighty. Come on, Woodville. Come on, Woodville. Come on, Woodville, to the Lord God Almighty. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Heads about as close. The first thing that I want to ask is our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed that today was the day that you died and you stepped into eternity. Are you ready for heaven? I had the great privilege of conducting a wedding on Friday and the family, the parents were in the first service. Evelyn didn't make it to the reception because she traveled to the city of Peterborough for a funeral of a colleague who a week ago Thursday was out golfing, incidentally, with Pastor Kyle's father, 18 holes golfing. The guys are probably laughing it up and having a good time, but this pastor the next morning had a massive stroke and stepped into eternity. And Friday was the service to honor his life. Please hear me. You have no guarantee of tomorrow. You got no guarantee of the rest of the day. Have you made your peace with God through Jesus Christ? Going to church doesn't make you a Christian more than standing in a garage makes you a car. It's good to give in the offering. It's good to read your Bible. It's good to take notes in the sermon, but that's not what saves you. Only Jesus can save you. I tell you, friends, no man can save you. Only Jesus can save you. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You are not always a believer. Just because daddy's a believer, mom's a believer, you can't get to heaven on the coattail of your faith of your parents. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If today was the day that you died, do you know that you're ready for heaven? Was there a time, a place, a moment that you asked Christ to be the center of your life? Perhaps today the answer is, I, I, I don't know. No, there wasn't a time and a place. Or I, I, I think I did, but no, I, I, want, I, want, I want to settle it today. Just a moment, I'm going to count the three. And after I count the three, if you want to be included and led in a prayer to ask Jesus to be the center of your life, I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand. You can put your hand down. There was a number of hands in first service. And I believe that there's, 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 there's a large number of people in this second morning service that, that this, this, this moment is yours. Don't, don't leave it. Don't walk out. Don't miss the moment. I'm going to count to three. And if you want to ask Christ to come in your life, I want you to lift your hand. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. One, two, three. That's you. Just lift your hand as you can. Yeah. 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 I see your hands. You can put your hands down. Yeah. You lift your hand. I want to lead you in this prayer and we're going to join you as you pray. Let's pray together. Dear Jesus. Let's pray that it again. Let's pray it again. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. I ask you into my life. Please forgive me of my sins. I have decided to follow Jesus. Today, 
I make my peace with you. Today, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Woodville. It's party time. Come on. Come on. It's party time. It's party time. There's, there's a lot of hands that went up. And if you, you prayed that prayer, you made the best decision of your life. If you don't attend a life-giving, Bible-believing church, we'd be honored to have you join us in the journey. In a couple of moments on your way out, go to the wall that says follow. we got a Bible for you. It's free. A little booklet for you. It's free. We have a follow class that can help you in your new faith. They'll tell you about it. It's Wednesday nights. Come. Let us bless you. This is your church. Get into a connect group. we got over 70 connect groups meeting in homes all across the greater Ottawa area. Go on the website. Go to the connect wall. This is your church. We want to see you finding your place of serving. Go to the serve wall. Can we one more time thank all of our guests for coming today? Come on. Let's just thank all of our guests. Honestly, we're so glad that you came. And we hope that you come back. Go to the guest lounge. We want to bless you. But pastor, I feel we need to sing to the Lord and focus on who our God is. Now, here's the deal. I want the altar workers and pastors to be available at the front. And if anyone would like personal prayer today for whatever you're walking to, we'd be honored to pray for you because our God is bigger than your problem. I said, our God is bigger than your problem. So we're going to believe that the windows of heaven would open. You need a miracle. You lack prayer. Come on forward. And so pastors and board and altar workers, I need you to come forward and make yourself available. Before we go, let's, let's worship in this song. Lift your voice. Focus on our God. Till my life you have been people are glad that all our life God's been faithful. Amen. Amen. I'm just going to close this in a word of prayer and the band's going to keep playing and Pastor Brad's going to keep leading in that song. And if you'd like prayer, this altar is open. And tonight, come to prayer, six o'clock. It's one hour and it's growing and we're seeing God do some amazing things. You're not coming for a Bible study tonight. You're coming for a prayer gathering. Come as a family. We have nursery available for your young ones. And uh, we hope you can be here 6 o'clock to 7. So just lift your hands. I want to pray for you. Father, thank you for everyone in this place. You're a good God. We love you. We want to seek the healer, not the healing. We want to seek the provider, not the provision. I pray the word would soak in our hearts. Thank you, God, for our time this morning. Go with each one. I pray for those at the altar. Touch them and meet them. Give us a great prayer night and a credible week. Let your love that's in us flow through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Nobody whispered, everybody shouted, amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. Sing this song as you go.